The Tale of the Nutcracker by Alexandre Dumas. Once in the town of Nuremberg, there lived a highly esteemed judge by the name of Zebrahaus. The judge had a boy and a girl. They were two lovely children, but so different in face and character that no one would ever have believed them to be brother and sister. Fritz was a chubby, blustering, and mischievous boy, one who would stamp his feet at the slightest annoyance. He was convinced that the world was created for his entertainment and stuck to his guns until the judge, intolerant of his cries and tears, emerged from his office. Raising the forefinger of his right hand, the judge merely said, Air Fritz! The boy was then taken with an enormous desire to sink into the ground. As for the mother, needless to say, no matter how high she lifted her finger, Fritz totally ignored her. His sister Marie, by contrast, was a frail and pallid child, with long curly hair falling on her shoulders, like a sheaf of movable and radiant gold. Marie was modest, gentle, affable, and merciful towards all sufferings, even those of dolls. She obeyed the slightest signal of her mother and never talked back. As a result, Marie was adored by everyone. December 24th had arrived, the day of gift-giving in Germany. Nuremberg is a city famous for its toys. It sends loads of these wondrous things all over the world, so that the children of Nuremberg must be the happiest on earth. I don't need to tell you that among the favorite children, those receiving the most toys, were the children of Judge Zebrahaus. For aside from their parents, who adored them, they also had a godfather by the name of Dorselmeyer, who also adored them. On that blessed Christmas Eve, twilight was beginning to settle in. All day long, Fritz and Marie were barred from entering the Grand Salon. When they were allowed to enter for the first time, they were given to a moment of ecstasy. They halted with eyes gaping and mouths gawking. The Christmas tree seemed to emerge from a large table that was fully laden with the best treats. The entire scene was shining with a hundred lights hidden in the foliage, which rendered it dazzling. Fritz danced about the room, and Marie didn't even try to hold back tears of joy. Things became worse when the two children saw the table piled high with all kinds of toys. Marie found a charming doll which she named Claire, and Fritz was gifted a whole squadron of soldiers. Marie discovered a new toy leaning mournfully against the trunk of the Christmas tree, a mannequin clad in an outstanding wardrobe, which revealed him to be a man of both taste and culture. The more Marie studied his face, the more goodness and sweetness she discerned in his features. After considering him with growing affection for over ten minutes, she exclaimed without daring to touch him, Oh, good father, that dear mannequin over there, leaning against the tree, whom does he belong to? To no one in particular, the judge replied. His job will be to break all the nuts you eat. He belongs to Fritz as much as to you. The judge then picked up the mannequin and opened the mouth to expose two rows of sharp teeth. At her father's bidding, Marie then put in a hazelnut and crack! The mannequin crushed the nut so skillfully that the shell shattered into a thousand pieces and the unbroken kernel remained in Marie's hand. The little girl now realized that the stylish mannequin was a descendant of an ancient and venerated breed of nutcrackers whose origins had been lost in the mists of time. Marie, delighted to have made this discovery, started jumping for joy. Wherein the judge said to her, Well, my good little Marie, since you like the nutcracker so much, then, though he belongs equally to Fritz and to you, you will be put especially in charge of caring for him. I therefore place him under your protection. With these words, the judge returned the mannequin to Marie, who took him into her arms and began carrying him to task. Now this captivating child had such a good heart that she selected the smallest nuts so that he wouldn't have to open his mouth immeasurably. However, while continuing to train his soldiers, Fritz had heard crack, 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 and after that sound was repeated 20 times, he realized something new was going on. He raised his eyes and observed the mannequin. He hurried over to Marie. Fritz now demanded his share of the nuts cracked by the mannequin, and his request was granted. He also demanded the right to crack them himself since he had half ownership. Fritz stuffed the largest and hardest nuts into the nutcracker's mouth. Then, at the fifth or sixth nut that Fritz had inserted, they suddenly heard crack and three little teeth tumbled out from the nutcracker's gums. Oh, my poor dear nutcracker, exclaimed Marie, snatching the mannequin from Fritz's hands. What a moron, cried Fritz. He wants to be a nutcracker, but he's got a glass jaw. He's a phony nutcracker. He doesn't understand his own profession. Hand him over, Marie. I've got to keep cracking him, even if he loses the rest of his teeth and his jaw is totally dislocated. No, cried Marie, squeezing the mannequin in her arms. You won't hurt my poor nutcracker anymore. Look, he's watching me so horribly, showing me his poor injured jaw. Goodness, you have a nasty heart. 
Because of their shouting, they were approached by the judge, the mother, and the godfather. The two children explained their reasons, the girl for keeping the nutcracker, the boy for getting him back. To her amazement, Godfather Dorselmeyer, with a smirk that looked ferocious to the little girl, sided with Fritz. Luckily for the nutcracker, the two parents came around to Marie's way of thinking. Dear Fritz, said the judge, I put the nutcracker under your sister's protection. To the extent that my paltry medical knowledge allows me to judge his condition, I can see that poor, wretched nutcracker is terribly injured and needs a lot of attention. Therefore, until his complete recovery, I assign full power to Marie. Fritz tried to impose, but the judge raised his finger to the level of his right eye, and these two words slipped out of him. Herr Fritz! We've already told you what a powerful impact those words had on the little boy. Ashamed of having drawn his rebuke, Fritz gently and wordlessly guided to the area of the table where he had stationed his soldiers. Meanwhile, Marie gathered the nutcracker's little teeth and wrapped his chin using a handkerchief. On his side, the mannequin, at first very pale and frightened, appeared to be highly confident about the kindness of his protector. Little by little, he grew more and more reassured, feeling very tenderly cradled. Evening had been advancing. It was almost midnight, and Dorselmeyer had long since taken his leave. The parents weren't able to tear the children away from their toys. Contrary to his habit, though, it was Fritz who first surrendered to their reasoning. Actually, said Fritz, upon getting drilled all evening, my poor miserable soldiers must be dog-tired. I know them. They are brave soldiers who are fully aware of their duty towards me. Since, as long as I am here, not a single man will permit himself to close his eyes, I am going to retire right away. And Fritz did indeed retire. Marie, however, stayed awake. Eager to join the judge, who had already gone to their bedchamber, the mother urged the girl to tear herself away from her dear charge. Just one more instant, said Marie. Let me finish my business here. I still have a lot of important things to take care of. Once I'm done, I promise I'll go to bed. The voice of this well-behaved and obedient child was so insistent that her mother saw nothing wrong in fulfilling her desire. The mother retired in her turn, saying, Go to bed soon, my dear little Marie. If you stay up too late, you'll be exhausted, and you might not get up tomorrow. Finding herself alone, Marie took up with the thought that occupied her more than any other, her poor little nutcracker, whom she still carried in her arm, wrapped in her pocket handkerchief. She placed him gently on the table and inspected his injuries. Nutcracker appeared to be suffering greatly. Marie took her protege into her arms stepped over to the glass cabinet where the toys were kept, and placed the nutcracker on the doll bed, and was about to return to her bedroom. However, the entire room around the poor girl emitted a throng of terse, dry noises. The clock, with a huge gilded owl in lieu of a traditional cuckoo, hummed louder and louder until a dozen hollow, husky strokes could be heard. Marie was terrified. She shuddered from head to toe and was about to flee when she spotted Godfather Dorselmeyer sitting on the clock instead of the owl. Upon seeing this, Marie stopped in her tracks and tearfully exclaimed, Godfather, what are you doing there? Come down to me and stop trying to scare me, you wicked man. With these words, a shrill hissing and an enraged snickering could be heard all around. Soon thousands of tiny pitter-patterings could be heard behind the walls. Then thousands of tiny lights flickered through cracks in the walls that could be seen. When I say thousands of tiny lights, I'm mistaken. They were actually thousands of tiny, brilliant eyes. Marie realized she was surrounded by a whole population of mice who were preparing to enter the room. And indeed, during the next five minutes, thousands of mice came pittering, pattering through the door joints, through the chinks in the floor. They lined up in the same fashion in which Fritz arranged his soldiers for battle. Suddenly, she heard a dreadful hissing. It was so acute and so prolonged that it sent an icy shiver up and down her spine. At that moment, the Mouse King appeared at her feet. He began to hiss and nibble hideously. The entire Mouse army dashed towards his king, squeaking three times in unison. Next, while keeping their ranks, the Mouse regiments rushed all over the room and headed towards the glass cabinet. And enveloped on all sides, the girl retreated towards the cabinet. Marie was no scaredy cat. But when she found herself encircled by an endless horde of mice, she was overwhelmed with fear. Her heart pounded so intensely that her chest was ready to burst. The blood seemed to freeze in her veins. She couldn't breathe. Half fainting, she reeled backwards. And finally, the glass cabinet, poked by her elbow, fell to the floor and shattered into a thousand pieces. A bizarre clamor resounded in the cabinet, and all the voices exclaimed with all their might, To arms! Let's get up! It's the enemy! To battle! 
Murray turned around. All the toys were on the move. Nutcracker leaped off the bed and onto the floor, yelling, Stupid mice! Get back to your holes or I'll take care of you on the spot! The threat triggered a wide hissing, and Marie realized the mouse had not returned to their holes. Terrified by the clatter of shattering glass, the mice had sought refuge under the tables and under the armchairs, and now they were beginning to venture forth. Nutcracker, far from being alarmed by the hissing, was now twice as courageous. Ah, miserable mouse king, so it is you, and you finally accept the challenge I have been offering you for ages. Come on, and let this knight decide which of the two of us is the better one. As for you, my companion, support me in this combat. Come on, forward, attack! No proclamation had ever had a similar effect. The reply from the toys was a resounding, Yes, my lord, you can count on us! Upon these words, Nutcracker felt so thoroughly electrified. The ranks were filled with all the toys from the cabinet, arming themselves with whatever they could grab. They were prepared for combat. Nutcracker gained control of this intrepid battalion. Mouse King had understood that he would be facing a full army. He gave the signal with a squeak, which was echoed in unison by his entire army. Amid the shouting of the combatants and the rattling of the dying, the girl kept hearing the voice of the Nutcracker prevailing over all. Bravo, my lead soldiers, bravo! If everyone did their duty as you, we would carry the day. However, through this very encouragement, Marie knew that the fighting was ferocious and the victory indecisive. The mice, thrown back by the soldiers and decimated by the platoon firing, kept returning faster and faster, biting and shredding anything in their path. There was an atrocious hand-to-hand -hand combat, in which each participant was attacked and defended himself without concern for his neighbor. Nutcracker tried, ineffectively, to govern all the different movements and to proceed in terms of masses. The soldiers, shoved back by an enormous corp of mice, had scattered, and they attempted, ineffectively, to rally around their captain. A huge battalion of mice cut them off from the army corps, overwhelming the civic guard. The front lines were falling. Mouse King ordered his troops to attack. Within a second, they were taken. The Nutcracker's troops were useless against sheer numbers and succumbed to the enemy power. Once the battle was lost, Nutcracker focused purely on making an honorable retreat. Still, to give his troops breathing room, he summoned the reserves. The gingerbread men and candy came down from the table and gave tit for tat. The troops were refreshed but inexperienced. The gingerbread men were particularly awkward, striking without rhyme or reason. They crippled friend and foe alike. However, they were useful. No sooner had the mice tasted gingerbread men and nibbled on sugar than they abandoned the fight. The mice pounced on the miserable reservists who were instantaneously surrounded by a thousand mice. After heroic defense, they were devoured. Nutcracker had wanted to profit from this moment of rest by rallying his army, but the ghastly spectacle had frozen even the most fiery courage. He had been deserted by his few remaining friends. Nutcracker made a final effort. The mouse king hurled himself at the Nutcracker. But Marie couldn't watch the ghastly spectacle any longer. Oh, my poor Nutcracker, I love you with all my heart, and now I have to watch you perish like this? Marie instinctively, and without realizing what she was doing, pulled off one shoe and flung it into the thick of the melee. She had such good aim that the projectile struck Mouse King and he rolled into the dust. At that same moment, the king and the army disappeared as if obliterated. The Nutcracker knelt before Marie and presented the Mouse King's crown. Marie was thrilled to accept it. The Nutcracker stood up and continued, Oh my dear mademoiselle, now that I have vanquished my enemy, what admirable things I could show you if you will accompany me. Marie didn't waver for an instant. She followed the Nutcracker, knowing she owed him her gratitude and quite certain he had no designs for her. Marie followed the Nutcracker into an old wardrobe next to the door. The Nutcracker helped her into it and they vanished inside. Suddenly, they were transported to a land filled with marvelous sights and smells. First, they encountered a fragrant meadow, which sparkled as if it had been completely strewn with precious stones. Marie noticed an admirable gate that was made out of preserves. The path they walked on was a pavement of pistachios. They were in the sugar candy plain. A charming forest opened before her. The forest, which though it may have been dark without the countless lights, was so thoroughly illuminated that you could distinguish the gold and silver fruits, which were suspended from branches adorned by ribbons and bouquets. We're in the Christmas tree forest, mademoiselle, said the nutcracker. Couldn't we stop here for a moment? It's so comfortable and it smells so good. Nutcracker clapped, and several shepherds and shepherdesses, huntsmen and huntswomen, emerged from the forest. They were so white and delicate and looked like sugar. 
They were carrying an easy chair made out of chocolate. They cordially invited Marie to sit down. No sooner were they sitting than the shepherds and shepherdesses, the huntsmen and huntswomen, took their positions. They began to dance a delightful ballet accompanied by horns. When the performance was finished, they vanished into the forest. The Nutcracker and Marie continued on. Not far from there lay a village where all the houses were brown, the roofs were gilded, and the walls were resplendent and encrusted with small candy. They arrived at a palace that was surmounted by hundreds of elegant turrets. The walls showed scattered arrangements of violets, tulips, jasmine, and these various colors enhanced the background against which they stood. What is this marvelous building? It is the Sugar Plum Palace, one of the most remarkable monuments in the capital of the Kingdom of the Dolls. A lady emerged from the palace. She was so richly adorned that Marie couldn't fail but perceive that she was the crown princess. Upon seeing Nutcracker, the lady flung her arms around him. Oh, my prince, my excellent brother! Nutcracker sounded deeply moved as he dried tears of joy that were gushing from his eyes. Taking Marie's hand, he introduced her to the princess. My dear sister, may I introduce Fräulein Marie Zeberhaus? She saved my life just as I lost the battle. She flung her slipper at the Mouse King. Had she not done that, I would be laying in a grave. The princess threw her arms around Marie. The Nutcracker started to describe all his adventures in detail. However, during his account, Marie was struck by something bizarre. Soon she was enveloped in a strange mist that changed into a silvery gauze, which grew thicker and thicker until it shielded the sight of the Nutcracker and Princess. Marie woke up and found herself in bed. It was broad daylight, and her mother was at her side saying, Is it possible to be as lazy as you? Come on, let's get up. Breakfast is waiting for us. Oh, sweet mother, said Marie. Where did the Nutcracker take me last night, and what admirable things did he show me? Marie recounted everything that we have just described. And when she was done, her mother said to her, You've had a very long and charming dream, dear Marie, but now you're awake. You've got to forget all that. Come and have breakfast. But Marie persisted in maintaining that it hadn't been a dream, that she really had seen all those things. Her mother then went to the cabinet, took the nutcracker, handed it to her daughter, and said, How can you imagine that this doll, which is composed of wood and cloth, can have life? The judge and Fritz were laughing their heads off at Marie's expense. The hilarity grew so loud that Marie realized she had to provide some evidence. She produced the crown of the Mouse King. Look, here is the Mouse King's crown which the Nutcracker gave me last night as a sign of his victory. The judge, quite amazed, scrutinized the crown. Fashioned out of an unknown and brilliant metal, the judge declared the crown to be so precious that he ignored Fritz's appeals to touch it. Her parents pressured Marie to tell them the origin of the crown, but she stuck to her account. Her father called her a liar and encouraged her to recant, threatening to throw out her dolls if she didn't give up her fantasy. Poor Marie no longer dared to talk about all the beautiful fancies that filled her imagination. One day, years later, when Marie was clearly older and had reached her teen because otherwise this ending is weird, so, <clears throat> one day, while Godfather Dorsemeyer was repairing a clock, Marie was staring at the nutcracker in the cabinet. She was so absorbed in her reveries that suddenly, forgetting that her godfather and mother were present, Marie accidentally cried out, Ah, oh, dear nutcracker, if you weren't made out of what it is my father claims, and if you really existed, I wouldn't desert you, for I truly love you. No sooner had Marie heaved a sigh that the room was filled with such a racket that the young woman fainted and fell to the floor. When she came to, she found herself in her mother's arms, and her mother said to her, How was it possible that you were foolish enough to fall out of your chair? At the very moment that Dorsal Meyer's nephew has returned from his travels. Marie turned towards the door and saw a young man with her godfather. The young man wore finest clothes. He brought gifts of the most delicious candy Marie had ever tasted. And at the end of this meal, he delighted them by cracking nuts with his teeth. After dinner, he invited Marie to join him in passing the glass cabinet. The young man knelt down before her and spoke. Oh, my excellent mademoiselle, you see at your feet the happy nutcracker whose life you had saved at this very place. You have been good enough to tell me that you wouldn't reject me if I had turned hideous. Now the spell cast on me by the mouse queen was broken the moment you said you loved me despite my hideous face. I have reverted to my original form. So, my dear Marie... If you still feel the same way about me, please do me the honor of giving me your hand and sharing my throne and crown, for I have become a king again. You are a good and friendly ruler, your majesty, and you have a charming kingdom. I therefore accept you as my fiancé. 
He went over to her parents, and with a graceful bow, he asked for Marie's hand, and it was granted to him on the spot. One year later, Marie was married in the Sugar Plum Palace. To this day, Marie is still the queen of the gorgeous kingdom of all kinds of magnificent and miraculous things. This has been the Lego Nutcracker, adapted from the Tale of the Nutcracker by Alexandre Dumas, adapted by Jen Herchek. This is a Chuck Herjoy production, December 2019. Merry Christmas!